Hello everyone and welcome to Quality Sewing and Vacuums Facebook Live. Or no, we're we're not Facebook Live. We are so fun today. Oh, we're at the end of January. So fun. I do too many Facebook Lives. Um, today, we wanted to welcome you to January. And today, it's going to be me and Donna. Unfortunately, Naomi couldn't make it today, but I am going to represent her and um, tell you all about her demos and things. And then I'm going to turn it over to Donna today. Welcome to So Fun live today we wanted to remind you that we have some great prizes at the very end uh, donna's going to be announcing two prize winners so if you're on please like us leave a little comment say a shout out from where you're from we'd love to hear where you are uh, if you have any questions please go ahead and leave a comment down below and we'll be answering those as we go uh, we also wanted to let you know that all the things that we're going to be talking about today are 20% off until February 1st. So that's next Thursday. You have a whole week to do your online shopping of all the things that we're going to be presenting and bringing in just for the month of January. So with that, we're going to get started today. Oh, I forgot to tell you, we also have um, in-person classes. We have 30 classes in all around the Seattle area in our 10 stores. We would love to have you there. If you can pop in sometime, we'd love to see your presence at these classes. When we're in person, there is camaraderie with friends, food, and prizes there too. So anyway, that's a little spiel about So Fun Life. All right. We're gonna get right into it, and I'm gonna be talking about the farmer's market applique that um, Naomi and Donna brought in. One of the things that Naomi loves to do is she loves to work on this machine over here called the scan and cut. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, how you can use the scan and cut to get these beautiful images cut out perfectly. There are many different ways that you can use farmer's market um, applique. These were, they brought in these vegetables that look like they're fresh from the farmer's market. This is going to be beautiful to hang on a wall. Um, they also talked about uh, making pillows with them, but the original design also comes with these beautiful table runners that you can see in the back here. Naomi made the full length one. Look at how beautiful that is. This is going to be great for the summertime after the 4th of July is all over and you have the rest of the summertime to celebrate. Why not celebrate it with a beautiful bounteous harvest looking table runner right here. Um, Donna did make hers right here with um, on the back, she found this adorable towel at the store that already had broccoli on it. So she also made the broccoli on the front of this little pot holder. And to make it, because she used the lighter colors on it on the side, she put a coating of Odie coat over the top. Um, and if you have questions about that, leave us a message and we'll answer those about what Odie coat is. It makes it waterproof so it's not gonna stain or get wet, which is really cool. Okay. Donna also made this beautiful, can you see it from down though? Yeah, so I'm gonna take it off for you, right here. She made this beautiful, just two panel wall hanging that she is going to put some little 3M hooks on the back and hang on one of the, the little sides of your cupboard um, to fill in that beautiful space so you can see all the, the beautiful applique all year long. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how to get these beautiful cuts of applique. There are many different ways that you can do it. The, the original, do you have the pattern? I do. We'll get the pattern for you so you can see it. Okay, here it is, right here. Ta -da! This comes with a CD um, with the SVG files, the cut files already in it. So with that, with the CD, you download it onto your computer or your laptop, whichever one talks to your scan and cut. You can download it onto your computer and then it goes right into your scan and cut because they talk to each other. And then, or if you want to just print it out of your printer, can you even see that? Oh, there you go. There's the little designs right there. Okay. If you want to just print these out, if like making your computers talk to each other is a little too cumbersome for you. The Scan and Cut has this really cool scanning mat. You see how it's all plain like that. 
It has a little clear sheet over the top. You pull that back. You slide in your images just like that. Put that down and you put it into your machine and it feeds it in and you have your images already scanned into your machine. So there are two different ways that you can download the images into your scan and cut. And then once it's saved, you can move over to your actual cutting mat like this. This is just a standard mat. You don't you can use the fabric mat if you would like to. Um, Naomi just uses the standard mat, which works great. I'm gonna set that aside just for a second while I pull out these little pictures ah, and knock that over. All right, so these are some of the colors that she used. Sorry, that's super shiny there. I wanted to show you she used just regular cotton and she also used our sparkle vinyl. We brought in some dark sparkle vinyl and some light sparkle vinyl from OESD. It is a beautiful washable vinyl that um, it has a cotton backing on it. It's really sturdy and, and really firm feeling. It's not flimsy. Um, what you're gonna wanna do with either your cotton or your vinyl is you're going to want to put Steam Seam 2 on the back. She has already added that onto the back here. The cool thing about the Steam Seam 2 is it's sticky on both sides. It is so great for repositioning. So she ironed this piece of Steam Seam on, and then you peel off the paper like so. And then with the, if I can pick this up, hold on. With the sticky side down, you're going to put that right onto your mat. Mat is sticky side up, fabric sticky side down. And what I have found when you do this, when you put the sticky side down with your steam steam already on it, it's your fabric is not going to move. I've had many incidences where my fabric, I start cutting, it starts cutting one way. And then when it goes the other way, all the fabric just comes off of it. But with this, I have had no problems with the steam seam down. You cut out your image and it will look like that. Oh, look at that. That was amazing, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and then you'll peel your image off. And what I love about that is that you're not going to have a lot of fraying around there. Okay. So we're going to set aside your little cut pieces and then we're going to go over here. And I have this hooped right here. And you can see that Naomi has already cut out some of the images. She did it in black so you can really see the outline. Oh, the outline of this little piece of asparagus right here. Some of it is already sewn. But you can see the, the file will tell you to do an image outline. And you can do this in like a green color so it doesn't show or a white. But it just shows you where you need to place your items after you have already gotten it cut out. And she mentioned to tell you that in some of these places, there's blank spots. It will do little pieces at a time because you will put a piece down and it'll sew a bit and then you'll layer another piece. It'll sew a bit and you layer, you just layer it as you go. So let's say you don't have a scan and cut, but you do have your, your images that you can cut out. We brought in these brand new scissors by Suki Sews right here. They're straight micro tip scissors and they come with a special little plastic covering there because those are so sharp and so beautiful. You are going to get just some of the most perfect little, I'll, I'll do a little heart here just to show you how amazing and oh man, not that you can really see that, but look at how, oh, there it goes. The point got that tip there just really perfectly. These tips are gonna go right in and get right into that, any little spot that you need right there. Okay, that turned out really great. These, um, what I love about these scissors, the tips of them are just so tiny and they can get into those little tiny places, especially if you have like, oh, 
little, let's say, a nest on the back of your your machine. You make this bird's nest underneath your needle and everything, and you're like, oh my goodness, how am I gonna get in there? These needle tips just go right underneath your machine. They get those out, and they do um, beautiful applique. And, and these are a great little pair of scissors to have right by your machine at all times. Okay. Um, so I hope that you can, oh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, Donna's. Um, she used the batiks from her own collection right here. And Naomi, in hers, she used the sparkle vinyl, which you can see gives this runner just the funnest pop. Um, after the 4th of July, you need a little sparkle still, right? So add some vinyl here, but it is almost St. Patrick's Day. So I know you're going to need to stock up on some of this green vinyl that we have in stock here. So make a little comment below. You can, we will add a link in just a moment here when I go to my computer and I will um, have all the products that we're going to talk about in the link. Oh, I almost forgot to talk about how you're going to get this applique to stick on there. We, well, we, Naomi and Donna picked out some beautiful King Tut thread right here. So I wanted to talk, oh, let's put it right here. The, they brought these. These are both variegated, which means that they, they kind of um, go from one color to another. And when I was talking with one of our applique makers, she says she only has a couple of colors of the variegated because these variegated colors will match almost anything. We have more of this lighter color that will go really good with browns, and we have this green that will go with almost any green. Um, <clears throat> Donna said that she used them for the little root system that came out below here, but they will just really beautify all of the surrounding applique. Um, uh, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about these, these are 40 weight threads. And the difference between the, this King Tut thread and any other King Tut, or any other 40 weight thread is that it's two ply. If you think about it like toilet paper, it's the difference between one ply and two ply toilet paper. So <clears throat> this King Tut thread is going to give you a little more bulk. It, it gives a, a little more um, presence when you want uh, your thread to really show and really shine. So with that, I think I got everything that Naomi presented. I'm going to turn the rest of our time over to the beautiful Donna. Take it away, Donna. Thank, <clears throat> thank you. Um, uh, let me start um, over here on my left with our garment pattern this month. It's called the Winwood Robe and Sleep Shorts by Lisa Lynn Company. <clears throat> and the first thing I want to mention, I'm so excited that finally this year, uh, so fun is going to cross over with educational classes into the stores. So every store I've visited in the South End has their robe made with the date and the time that they're going to offer this class. Now here in Tukwila, you'll be able to sign up for this class on February 16th from 1030 to 230. And this is the sample that's been made by one of our educators. Isn't this pretty? Lightweight, silky soft, and just gorgeous. Look for those classes every month. They'll always change. Uh, they won't always be garments, but someone will be picking um, a pattern, say from February. And then in March, you'll have the opportunity to sign up for the class. So part of this pattern is the, the pattern for the sleep shorts. And um, Andrea said these look like perfect running shorts. Well, she can run all she wants to, but me, those days are over. It's a kind of a retro 1970s NBA pattern. Real short with this band across the, the bottom leg that you can do in the same fabric or you could do in contrasting fabric. They're so easy to put together and the facing that comes for this leg is applied from the inside and rolled to the outside and then hemmed with a top stitch. And you get that cute little tulip opening. 
Now, I love to sleep in sleep shorts, so this, this was the perfect pattern for me. Uh, this fabric that I'm holding up here is from um, one of the pop-up shops from Amanda's Bundles that we do throughout the year. And this is her Peach Performance Weight Knit. And it's brushed on the inside, real comfortable, and then a nice, nice weight for these shorts or even for leggings. Now, Naomi is showing you how versatile this pattern is because I think this would be perfect to use in the spring as a, as a lightweight coat or a little duster. The pattern includes this beautiful pleat in the back. And then you can choose to do the same fabric on the collar or you can do it contrasting. She's used the same fabric, this beautiful waffle weave in teal. Now she did not uh, add the pockets, um, but here is the belt loop that would tie right across here where those shawl collar, um, the collar ends. <clears throat> and then finally, here on the little mannequin, you can see I took this more literally and looked for a like a beautiful bamboo, uh, it's polyester, but it, it looks like it's silk. So it's more um, kimono style. And I just used the interior of the fabric and turned it right side out. And that's where I get my contrasting collar pocket cuffs. And I did see one robe on the road where they had done the tie in the contrasting too. So that was very cute. It comes in extra small through 2XL. And the pattern I feel is a very generous cut. So it, uh, it should be a good fit for everyone. Now, moving on, we're going to talk about this tiny little pattern here and what i like so much about this pattern is that it's easy to store and it doesn't take up a lot of room it's called the japanese knot bag and it's about a two hour project once you get your pattern ready here is the inside and you can see right here right right here <laughs> are the are the two templates for the two size bags now the hardest part of this pattern was getting that template blown up to the 400% that the pattern company asks you to do great ways to do that would be to take the pattern to the library and set the printer there on 400% and print it out but of course, you know me, I have to do things the hard way. So I tried to use my little home printer and just put this face down. And I probably had to make five or six or seven different printouts and then tape it all together. Once I did that, then I cut my patterns out in Swedish tracing paper. You can also go online to this company and download the 400% sign size and send it right to your printer. And then your printer will tile that out on the needed pages. Now I just take all of the supplies that I create from a pattern like this, plus the pattern itself, and then tuck it away in a little envelope for easy storage. Now, the, the patterns come in a large size and a small. And this is the small. This is my Valentine uh, knot bag this month. Now, the secret to this pattern is you are going to cut the handles out. They start out even. And then as you construct the bag, you're going to reduce the length of this by about an inch and a half on both sides. And then when it's all done, you thread the long handle 
through the short one and there is your knot. Now this is a perfect bag for like Valentine candy, uh, gifts at Christmas time, maybe a craft knitting or uh, a cross stitch project. Anything that you can, you can think of will be great, a great use for these bags. How about Christmas fabric and include a pocket? Now this isn't Christmas, obviously, but if you, if you take the negative space cut out of here, it's just the perfect size for a pocket and a gift card. Or how about cat treats? Now these are all the small. And as I traveled around, um, the last two weeks, I got tons of ideas from our audience members. And the one I liked the best was a little tiny silk-like prom bag. Now, the one thing I will mention, you can get the small pattern and use it on a, a fat quarter. But if you want to do the larger pattern, it's going to take two fat quarters or yardage. So just, just be thinking of that when you're looking at fat quarters and you say, oh, I want to do that Japanese knot bag. You do need two fat quarters for this. So moving on, uh, we're going to talk about my um, favorite item this month. Let me take it out of the bag so it doesn't glare. It's called the Repum, the Repum <laughs> messenger bag. Um, this really struck home to me because uh, I, I've made her patterns before. It's Charlie's aunt, but the designer actually lives in Sussex, England. And I was uh, fortunate enough to make a trip to England this fall. So I just knew that I was going to go on this trip and I was going to find some fabric to do these, this reproduction 1940s messenger bag. Now Naomi constructed her first one out of felted wool. And she said her favorite part are these three little pleats that give interest to the bottom of the bag. She's done the magnetic closure and the lining with the one pocket that comes with the pattern. Now, as she traveled around, people mentioned uh, the, the buttons that are shown on the pattern and, and the buttons that I have. And so she thought, well, maybe I can jazz this up a little bit. And she quickly sat down and stitched out some freestanding lace. So once this stabilizer is washed out of this, it will be easy to just tack this down on that blank canvas top flap. Now, if you can plan ahead, you certainly could put your embroidery design on here before you construct the bag. One of the notions that we have this month are called gate rings. And if we can get a real close up of this, this looks like a stationary store ring that would hold paper, but it's way cooler than that. You see that there's the hinge right here and here's the opening, so it doesn't open half and half. It's just a tiny little opening, and instead of flipping open, it opens inward. And that's where it just unhooks from your purse. And any time you put any pressure on that little gate, it keeps it closed. It will not open on you as you're carrying your bag. Now we have this in antique gold, gunmetal, and nickel. So those are three that are available this month from uh, your list of notions. 
Now this is some of the fabric that I picked up in, in England. It's linen and it, it's a little worse for wear. It, it had some faded spots on it, but you know, I think that adds to the retro look. Like this purse didn't just come out from my sewing machine a couple weeks ago. I've had it forever. Um, I did add an extra pocket, half, <clears throat> half pocket on the, on the back. And then I reinforced all the linen with uh, layers of ShapeFlex 101, which is a woven fusible that gives your purses a nice soft uh, body to start with. And then instead of using um, uh, a soft and stable type product, I didn't have any of that in black. So I had a remnant of headliner that I used on this front flap. And two layers gave me this really deep textural quilting line. And because the purse was kind of on the, the dull side, I jazzed it up. I'm backwards on the camera. I jazzed it up with these resin buttons that someone had gifted me. Now, I like to take my lining pieces and stuff as many pockets as I can in there. There's probably four or five pockets, one is a zipper. And so you just lay your lining pieces out on the table, start designing your pockets, and once you're done, then you can sew that together. Now the hint I learned on purses, because invariably the lining seems a little bit too big for the purse. So I heard the other day that you should sew your outer fabric with a half an inch seam allowance, and sew your lining fabric with five eighths. So now you've reduced the bulk at least by a quarter. And it helps in the bottom, there isn't so much fabric gathered in the bottom of the bag, and it helps along the sides also. And then I finished it off with a leather, hand-sewn leather handle that I picked up at the last expo I went to in the fall. And so that's the finished um, bag true to the pattern size. Now I know the picture of the pattern does look a little bit bigger on her. And sometimes that happens between the design and the original sample and then what is actually manufactured pattern wise. So we wanted to make sure you knew that this was the size that you'll get from that pattern. Of course, I couldn't be happy just there, so I went and drew my pattern an inch larger on all four sides, and I came up with this. And everyone says this looks like a kilt. It is some wool that I also purchased in England and it's got this nice big roomy cell phone pocket where you just drop your cell phone in, the magnet shuts, and you know it's pretty safe. And three buttons. Again, I used ShapeFlex 101 to secure and help with the body of this wool. And then lots of custom pockets in there. Now the gate rings again are the the antique gold and the handle is self um, self faced with um, vinyl from Sally Tomato and I want to demo how that works you've cut your handle out in the wool to the size that it calls for, or larger if you, if you want to. And you're going to take your wool and fold raw edges to the center, press it really good, and then I didn't want another wool layer on here because I thought it was gonna be too heavy, so I had some of this Sally Tomato Pebble Faux Leather. So I cut a strip of that out and with this great new basting glue that you can use either 
the tiny little tip. Or in my case, I use the, the wider tip and use this to smear it on most all of the, the wool on the entire strap. Now this is washable and it will come out, so, but it's a great tool to use for just temporary basting. Then I laid the vinyl strap down on the glued wool and to get a good connection between the two of them, I came along with this Pro Series seam roller. Now this you could use at the side of your machine to open up your seams and press them um, as you're building blocks. But this is also would be a good craft roller to use when you're using glue, maybe you're rolling air bubbles out of a, a, a decoupage, or maybe even if you're a scrapbooker and you need to like roll some adhesive uh, decor on your pages. So this is just a really good craft roller. And this is also on your list today. And so that just makes this now the crossbody bag that is designed on the, the pattern envelope. Okay, we're going to move on to now I'm going to come around and do a sewing demo. And what this is going to help you achieve are the nice sharp corners on that purse. This is also a technique that I use when I'm making pillows. You've got a nice sharp corner and when you turn your fabric inside out, you want that corner to remain. So, where's my stiletto? I've sewn a corner here in contrasting fabric on kind of a, a linen-like fabric. It's a little loose. And this is your standard two and a half inch, thank you, Two and a half inch seam allowance. Well, that's, that's kind of loose for that, that weave of fabric. So, could I get the scissors? <laughs> the first thing you want to do with your corners, thank you, is you're going to grade your seams. And grading your seams means cutting one seam real close and the next one just a skosh bigger. And that reduces the bulk to start with in this corner. Many of you might know this term from uh, garment sewing. We do a lot of uh, seam grading in garment sewing. Then you're going to dial your, your stitch length down to 1.5 on a good um, solid woven cotton, but on this loose sort of linen, I've dialed it down to one. So that thread is going to go in and hit almost every uh, thread that's woven on the corner. Now I'm just going to start and sew right across at an angle. Okay. And sure enough, I missed the corner. So I'm going to do it again. I like to use a completely open toe foot because sometimes you're working so close that you can't, you can't see where you're laying the thread down. So if you can see this, 
that stitch is about a sixteenth of an inch from the corner and it's protecting all of these threads when you cut that corner off. And then you're going to take your stiletto or your purple thing or whatever or your fingers and turn that and my favorite turner is the expert point press tool from OESD and with that little tiny ball you're just going to work that fabric into a sharper corner than you would have gotten if you had left all of that fabric in there so just and with this tool you don't have to worry about pushing through and breaking any threads so and you just work that out until you're happy with that turn and then press it good and do the rest of the corners that you are working on while I have you here at the machine I want to talk about the 9 by 14 pedal mat if you're having trouble with your mat uh, or your pedal creeping across your carpet or your hardwood floor this is a great item it's textured on the top to hang on to the pedal and then it's got a nice grippy back that will work on any type of floor hardwood carpet tile or ceramic um, so that is the pedal mat that we have this month and to go along with um, just general sewing it's easy to find a 60 inch ruler but oftentimes you're trying to measure your batting um, or your backing fabric and you're working on like a queen size so this is a hundred and twenty inch uh, lightly reinforced fiberglass tape measure and it's clearly marked with nice uh, black lines and hash marks for eighth quarter and half and then the back is also in metric if if you have learned that so okay let's see what the next project is it's called love on the runner this is our ode to valentine's day this month and this is a four heart strip pieced table runner and we have them right here now Naomi has done there's two more hearts on the back Naomi has done hers in the traditional red and red and red and white um, uh, different fabrics for her strips and she's followed the pattern and done her binding right through that last two and a half inch strip also um, she included a beautiful spring fabric and made this reversible so now she can go right from valentine's day into spring and easter quilted on her long arm with just an overall um, kind of swirly beautiful pattern now if you've heard me talk before I like to give some breathing room to my designs so I I generally do not bind through this last strip and what that gives you is the opportunity to do something funky so if you don't have enough background fabric or you're going to seam it here anyway why not put in a little hash mark so that creates a border at the bottom and instead of bringing this down to a point I just lopped it off and then here is my back just scraps off the the uh, scrap bin and what you get by adding that border is almost a bed runner 
So you could, you could add even more. You could put another heart on there. You could add more wider borders. But it's just a very versatile pattern. And I'll show you the single that I did. This is the single heart. And all you need to do is get the heart constructed. And it, uh, the directions say that you should use eight different fabrics. In this case, I used five, the center fabric, and then I just repeated out with the same fabrics to complete the whole heart. Then you lay this down on some kind of pattern material and you create your own template to fill in that corner. So here is, <laughs> here is what I like to use is tearaway stabilizer that I might have already decided to throw away. I'll just resurrect it, press it real good, and then turn this into the template for this lower corner. Now I have the ability to choose whether I want to make the table runner or I want to make individual hearts. So there's one with the white surrounding the heart. And here is the second one where there's a dark color surrounding the heart. So the, very, uh, very fun to work with. Um, I will say that the quilting on this heart happens to be a variegated King Tut, uh, the 40 weight, 100% cotton thread that we were talking about earlier. This is just a pinkish uh, lavender thread. And this is really the first time I've used King Tut to quilt. And boy, is it amazing. I really love the definition you get in those quilt lines. Um, and then I have this so tight demo to show you. First of all, we have the so tight uh, magnetic pin holder. And it's just a, dia a disc with a magnetic disc underneath it, but it's magnetized. And the idea behind this is instead of wearing a big wristlet with pins in it, put this under your clothing wherever you have a tendency to put your pins. And so any uh, stray pin that you find uh, just well, then don't you know, I've got that upside down. Um, stray pin will just uh, land on that and stay. Now, my big problem is I put pins in my mouth. And I'm suggesting that you probably don't do that. But what about having this up close on your collar? And maybe you'll break that habit. And that leads us into the so tight uh, magnetic cutting system. And this is a fully magnetized cutting mat, two sided, dark and light. And it comes with this acrylic ruler and 12 boosters. So in my sewing room, I don't have a lot of room. So I said to myself, how can I maximize um, this, this mat? So I put it right on the corner so I can access it this way or from the side. Now, if you use it this direction, it is large enough to cut a fat quarter. If you come around this way, it's large enough to cut uh, 45 inch fabric folded salvage to salvage. So what I would do with a, a long piece of fabric, I would press it really good, get it all lined up. And then because this part of my table, of course, is still mounded with 
patterns and ideas. I don't have any room for uh, a long cut. I would just take the fabric and then drop it over the side. Get it all lined up. Take six of your boosters and just um, secure that fabric as it drops and then use the other six boosters on the acrylic ruler as you put it down and start to make your cuts. Now it's really important that you use a sharp rotary cutter. And I am guilty of leaving my blade in way too long. But if you have a sharp rotary cutter and the magnetized ruler and mat, your cuts are gonna be so smooth and so effortless, you aren't gonna to have to reef down on this ruler and worry about it walking um, up here at the top as you finish. Just a sharp blade and a little bit of pressure and you're gonna cut your strips or your blocks, um, whatever you're working on. So those are two products from So Tight this month. Um, let's go on to um, one more item. One thing I will um, caution you about is cutting batting on your mats. Do it as le less frequent as you possibly can because especially as your blade starts to dull, you are going to embed the batting fibers into that self-healing cut and then it's difficult to get them scrubbed back out again. So we've got this month, we have the Marty's Choice um, batting tape. And this is one place where you do have to cut your batting on your mat, but it doesn't take much pressure to cut batting. So with a sharp blade, you can just lightly cut your batting so that the edges are perfectly straight and what I would do is line up my batting on the ironing board. I would take the two inch batting strip and cut it in half. Then I get twice as much. Instead of two inches by 10 yards, I have one inch by 20 yards. So I get twice the value out of the package. And you've got that all lined up and then you're going to, of course, on a mat or on your ironing board, you're going to take your iron and just gently press over the surface of that Marty's tape. And you keep pushing it together as you go down the length. And then you have secured that batting and you can save that for another project instead of whacking that up and putting it in the cat bed. Um, you can have uh, all kinds of projects. I think every one of my quilts today has some kind of Marty's uh, batting tape in it because I just didn't have quite enough batting to finish the projects. Okay, let's move on. We are now going to talk about um, our book. And this was such a great experience. Um, we're going to take a minute and move this table out of the way so that you can actually see um, some of these quilts. Now, the book this month is called Adventures in Improv. And it's by Cindy Grisdella. And she's, she's quite famous in the improv quilting world. And rightly so. She is so creative. Um, but she's written a book that doesn't give you a quilt that you have to start and finish. She's just given you guidelines. Color. How to select color. And, and, and pattern versus solid. Um, she gives you some exercises that you're going to do to um, complete these projects. 
So let's start with Naomi. Her first project is called Playing with Color. And you can see it's that rainbow. And the secret to this is to take your block, your predetermined block size is bigger than the end result. And what I mean by that is if you want a six and a half inch finished block, you're going to start with an eight inch cut. And you're going to stack up four colors in a monochromatic range. And once they're stacked, you're going to use your rotary cutter and do this freehand cutting. And your end result is three cuts and four pieces of fabric. Now you're going to shuffle these. Put them all back together. Do not worry that these edges don't fit. They won't. It will come up looking like a Frankenstein block. Just be conscious of the fact that you get the center stitched um, really well. And what that creates, and let me take this down so you can see it close. Here is her, here's a good one to, to look at. This block here, there's one slice, the second slice, the third, and then this little tip is a fourth color of fabric. So up close, you can see where she's pieced those together. But back a ways, it's just a beautiful ombre rainbow blend. And it's so interesting, and it's a really good guided exercise to start with if you struggle with color. Now, Naomi loves to do minky on the back of her quilts. And this is the blue minky. That shows you the quilting better. And she's calling this uh, a toddler's lap quilt because it, it's so petite. Now, in my house, this would be a piece of art. I would want this on the wall. I would want to look at it every day, especially in these gray days of Seattle. And then up on the wall, uh, Naomi has interpreted her uh, guided exercises into leaving more negative space. So let's see where I, here we go. The next exercise would be this one, where you're using a central square and then maybe some lines that radiate out, but the rest of the quilt is blank and it's up to you to put your quilting in it. So those are leftover cave fabrics from the rainbow quilt. And then she's used two um, blues to uh, radiate out from that block three different ways. Now typically she uses minky on the back, the uh, pieced quilt on the front, and one layer of soft uh, Mormon natural. In this case she's used a cotton, bamboo, and wool blend and she's used two layers of batting in this. This is where she gets that beautiful depth in her quilt lines. Someone remarked that it almost looked like Trapunto. And so really what this quilt is about is the negative space and that beautiful little hash mark with the little circle. Now, of course, she's done this with her computerized uh, quilting, long arm quilter. This other large one that she did, these are two and a half inch blocks that are just scraps that normally would sit in wherever you keep your scraps. I have mine in a bucket by color. And it breaks my heart that they can't come out and play with the rest of my fabric. So she's broken these loose and she started with this little one by one and a half inch square and just made a traditional log cabin. 
and then started adding to it and where she needed to extend that block she put in a coping strip look at this little bitty slice just anything goes there's no rules in this improv design and so she's gotten out here to this size quilt used the rest of it for negative space and then quilted this beautiful design on this coral minky and then finally from her we've got this example and this is just um, appliqued but I want you to see the quilting design so the flower head and this the stems are all scrappy constructed and then laid right on the surface of her fabric and pressed uh, with a, um, a fusible. So it's a raw edge design. And then she's come back and computerized uh, this beautiful dahlia in one corner that, that flows right into these ocean waves. And she's quilted right over the um, raw edge applique. And of course, this is going to be a wall hanging, so she's not put the minky on the back. She's put a, a cafe fabric. And then <clears throat> my two examples are going to be over <coughs> here. And like I said, this is not a quilt that you're going to point to in the book and say, I'm going to, I'm going to make that exactly. She's got examples of her work and examples of her students' work and good advice how to get started. And so le let me talk about how I got started. I read uh, the first half of the book, and before I got to the guided exercise, I said, well, let me just try and work on something from her, her advice. So I pulled this out of the scrap bag. Um, I guess I thought I was going to make a mug rug with it. It's just scraps that I wanted to use up. And I thought, let me build a design around this. Now, Cindy does tell you in the book that you need to be uh, aware of when to stop. So I wanted this block to go over here. And no matter what I did, it didn't match the other three. So I know now when to stop. Stop, don't put that in. So that left me the big field of white. And I put some little scraps that I created on adding machine paper. The white, I needed to break that up. So I put that one those one inch slashes in through here. And then just mostly half square triangles. So this was my first attempt without doing an exercise with her. The other thing that she points out is know when to stop and if you're not happy with the way it looks this way, try turning it upside down. Maybe you'll like it better that way. So I thought, well, I, I, can, do, I can do better than that. I will just put those triangle holders in every corner I cut a yardstick down and now I can turn this four different directions maybe once every three months I just go over and I put the yardstick in the two other corners and I've got a whole new design so consider that when you're working with her method now, the two guided exercises that I did, this was retro circles, and this is reminiscent of the one that Naomi did in the rainbow colors, where you stack the four fabrics on top of each other and then make your cuts. And then you reassemble, 
And you know, this is your design. You get to pick what this is called. Okay, I'm going to call this Shades of Autumn. So that brought in some of the brighter colors, the golds, the rust, the terracotta, even a little bit of green. And I, as I got the blocks um, laid out in the order that I wanted them, I thought, how am I going to make this look more, more like autumn? So I got everything sewn together on my batting, backing, and by the way, there's my corner. So I've got this upside down. <laughs> um, shades of Autumn. What can I do to make that even more uh, apparent? And that's where hmm, the King Tut thread comes in, which is over there on the table. The two colors of King Tut this month are Malachite, which this maple leaf is triple stitched with the Malachite uh, King Tut. And then here is the Bulrushes, which is a little bit more on the brownie uh, side. And then I had some of this color at home, which is a peach and yellow. And I just created a, a, a set of leaves. I pinned them on where I thought they could focus really good on the, the leaf colors, and I just stitched them out. And then to finish it, you have permission to quilt horizontally and not use your ruler, not space it out properly, just space it out however you want. Up here, this is the top, so I started with this, and I was doing really fine lines, and the more I worked on it, the more I wanted to be done. So you can see the lines have really increased to the bottom. But this is my quilt, my idea, my <laughs> art, and my lines are now the wind. So I get to tell my story <laughs> about this quilt. Maybe I'll tell my grandsons and they'll be all, oh, um, maybe not. And then finally, this one is the exercise called Blue Puzzle, which is this one down here. And I've just taken solid fabrics. My inspiration was the four acid green charm squares that I had left over from the only other solid color project I've ever done. And so I wanted to use them up, and the idea behind it is to just do these controlled log cabins. And as you get larger, maybe you put some funky little stripes in, or a whole one side is striped. Just have fun. Just, I, I, I can't explain it, but it was so liberating to not have to follow a pattern just by sight look at someone's work and then go and reinterpret it in my own mind. So that's what I did. You get, you, you strive for four like 20 by 20 inch blocks, um, lay them out and then start figuring out coping strips that are going to make it fit together and suddenly You've got a square that you can put a border around and bind. So I had this quilted in this prism shape. And when you look at it with all those colors, it reminds me of stained glass. So I think we are done. Do we have some winners? Yes, we do. Okay. Oh, I love this pattern. And could you have them? message me? Yes. So this is a, also a fabric confetti pattern with uh, placemats and all kinds of really cute fruit. Um, and it is going to Susie White from West Virginia. Good for you. And you need to leave a message for Andrea at andrea at qualitysewing.com and we will get this to you.
and then we have a very time appropriate fat quarter bundle in shades of valentines and this is going to alexa donnelly again message andrea at andrea at qualitysewing.com and we'll make arrangements to get this to um, the store that is closest to you so i had a really good time uh, preparing these these items this month because i was so excited about um, the the fabric i was able to pick up in england and uh and share that with you and so i guess that's that's it for today i will be back in may and thank you for joining us